So St. Robert Bellarmine is born in 1542 in uh, central Italy, a city called Montepulciano, which you might recognize if you're a wine lover. Um, so Montepulciano is, you know, situated in where in a place where you have a, a strong culture of, you know, Renaissance humanism, reform of the church, a lot of very polished, you know, noblemen, also a lot of poor noblemen like his father was, but his mother was very, very pious. Uh, she raised him with a, she almost had a mania for fasting and almsgiving and Robert picked that up from her most certainly. So he, um, grows up very devout, very learned. He learns Latin extremely well, very young. Uh, he tells us in his autobiography that he used to write Latin poetry, and he never used a word that didn't have Virgil's authority, which, if anyone's ever tried it, it's, it's uh, even for me, it's a lot of work, and, you know, I'm, I've been well, doing Latin. And it for also presumes how well you would know Virgil. Right, exactly, and he, and he did. Yeah. Um, and you could see that. He waxes poetic on it later in life, too, and uh, he actually wrote, he was very good in poetry. He wrote a him to St. Mary Magdalene that is ended up being used by Pope Clement VIII in the breviary. It's still in the Roman breviary today. And he, um, you know, he thought it was a joke, so he didn't actually know that the Pope would actually take his hymn and put it in the breviary, wow. as he says in the autobiography. But in any event, um, he came to realize his vocation, which was a blow to his father, because his father's like, oh, good, we're going to get a doctor out of this, and it'll make some money for our poor family. And then he decides he has a vocation to the Jesuits, who not only have absolute poverty at the, at the time when, when the word Jesuit was a good thing. <laughs> um, and actually, it was usually synonymous with reform in piety and uh, in learning and so many other things. So he uh, he determined that this was his vocation. His father was kind of aghast. You can't do that. And then after a while, he finally relented because he saw the toll it was taking on his mother. His mother had met one of the companions of Ignatius, Pasquez Bruet. And he made such an impression on her that she'd conceived in her heart the hope that uh, at least one of her sons would become a Jesuit, wow. which Bellarmine does. So uh, he gets a year uh, to, with his cousin who had decided on the same to think about it. And so they go to a nearby town where there's a fellow and they spend time in prayer and also working on, um, you know, the, the classical Latin learning and, and philosophy and other things. And finally, after that was done, his father is convinced his vocation was genuine. And so then he was allowed to go to the Jesuits, and then he's received by uh, Lenya, who's one of the companions of Ignatius that came out of Paris. And so uh, after a, you know, a, a fortnight for a retreat, he goes to prove his mettle with the pots and pans, and then he's a Jesuit. And this is in 1558. So this is two years after St. Ignatius died. And uh, then you know, he proceeds to become one of the best students in the Roman college. And after that, they said, all right, well, let's, let's send about preaching. And in these days, um, you know, Trent Hall only just closed, and you could still get away with this, whereas you couldn't today. And actually, yeah, where, you know, he's not even in orders. He hasn't even been tonsured yet, technically, as a Jesuit brother. And they send him out to preach, and he's even in the pulpit preaching. And, uh, and then they would have a priest with him that would hear the confessions, which were the fruit of his preaching. He was actually known as being one of the most prolific preachers of his day. So much so that when he was teaching theology a couple years later in Padua, that the, in Louvain, um, in Belgium, they, they asked for him to see he was such a proficient Latinist. They needed somebody that could uh, work a vernacular Latin sermon every Sunday because they had a course of sermons for the year. And because there was such a melting pot in Louvain uh, of so many different languages, so many people knew at least enough Latin to work their way around business and whatnot. So that uh, so there was a and plus the students in the university as well. So they had a, a whole course of Latin sermons. So he ends up getting sent to Leuven for seven years. And what interesting too is he has a photographic memory. Uh, when he was previously sent to a school in Piedmont, he was told, "Oh, you're going to have to teach Greek," and he had to write to the superior, "I don't know Greek." And they said, "Oh, we're, we're sure you'll manage." <laughs> and so he uh, <laughs> starts the class with. Uh, now before we get on to Demosthenes, we're going to review all the principles you learned last year. And then at night, he's keeping himself up, learning everything that he's got to teach the next day. But he ends up learning so quickly and doing so well that within two weeks, he was actually expounding upon Demosthenes like a master of Greek. And he re retained that mastery of Greek to, uh, to the end of his life. Hebrew, he does the exact same thing when he's in Louvain, is that uh, he learned it. with, And that was more complicated because Greek, at least you have grammars, you have these books drawn up. In Hebrew, you didn't have a grammar. He wrote the first grammar of Hebrew. It was used for 200 years by both Catholics and Protestants. Really? Bellarmine did? Yes. He did, because before that, you have things like Batabolus, uh, Rules for Rabbis, you got Reuchlin's Notes, you got yeah. all these different things that with uh, scattered and right. just working. Origin, he, didn't he just hire a rabbi or something? <laughs> I think so, yeah, yeah, something like that. So you have uh, so you have the scattered bit 
of information. So Bellarmine systematizes it into a grammar, and he boasted that he could teach somebody within a week to do to read uh, the Old Testament with a dictionary, which he, which he did. He actually had a couple of people take him up on it, wow. and and they were able to do it. So he just had this genius photographic memory. And so likewise, he's in Leuven. He was at tasked with teaching sacred theology. So he makes a uh, revolutionary move that ends up becoming the norm going forward, which is he replaces the sentences of Peter Lombard with the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas, because it used to be, it's not that nobody ever read the Summa, people read the Summa all the time. Right. But even the Dominicans, when you're going through your course of studies in theology, this is going to be St. Peter Lombard, not yes. uh, not St. Thomas. So Bellarmine is the first one. And, and Thomas he, himself here. wrote commentary on yes. Lombard, of course. And so the, uh, and everybody did, Bonaventure yeah, did, Scott did, just... uh, fill in the blanks. And so the uh, the importance of this, um, he, Bellarmine pioneers this in the Ratio Studiorum of the Jesuits, which, you know, they had all held to St. Thomas, but he's the one who makes that a move that becomes distinctive to the Jesuits. And the results that they attain cause this to be a common thing throughout Europe now, is that the Summa, rather than the sentences, become kind of the norm for your training. It was simpler, you need to learn a lot better, a lot quicker, rather than getting stuck in various scholastic disputations. And so... Um, so, so then again, that's Bellarmine. He has a commentary on the Summa, which uh, is in manuscript still. It's in the Jesuit archives in Rome, and that's that's one hope I have at some point that I would get be able to be able to get in there and start uh, transcribing it. And um, I probably wouldn't do it myself. I'd probably have some smart Thomist you know, translate yeah. it, and uh, I just I would love to see something like that. But anyway, that's in the amazing. meantime, uh, is it complete? So is is the whole commentary on the Summa Theologiae complete? I believe so. I've seen extracts of it in facsimile. I've not uh, seen the entire thing, but I, I've heard that it is. Yeah. So, uh, nevertheless, um, so his time in Leuven is very profitable for him, and then, of course, he deals with a lot of Protestants, and this being in Italy, you don't really see many Protestants. You might have heard of them. Well, now he's on the front lines of the last Catholic outpost of the North, as it were. So he uh, gets permission from his superior to, because back then you needed to need permission for these things, he to read all the works of the Protestants, and so he starts going through Luther, through Calvin, through. Yeah, that's an important uh, no, no. I mean, people don't realize that the heretical books were mm -hmm. kept separate. Yeah, in the library, you them. had to go and get a special permission, mm -hmm. and the and the your your formators would say, "Yeah, I, I think you won't be tainted by the errors." Right, more or less. Yeah. So Bellarmine, and because again the photographic memory, he had uh, spent all the time working through this material and became rather very well acquainted with their actual teachings, whereas one of the problems is a lot of Catholics uh, writers in this subject hadn't actually read uh, many of the Protestants or hadn't understood them correctly or well. So a lot of their books just kind of fell flat in trying to answer them because they didn't really understand the, the root cause. Even Luther, even back in 1521, uh, <clears throat> the theologians that wrote Ex Surge Domine for uh, uh, Pope Leo X, yeah, they didn't Luther. understand the notion of faith alone in Luther. So they condemned a good number of his doctrines. They didn't get, they didn't really understand what he was talking about with justification of faith alone. So that actually didn't make the condemnation because they, did, they didn't really get his teaching. Right. It was actually St. John Fisher who was the first one that really gets and nails that particular teaching. Right. So beside that, so, so Bellarmine's a similar thing. So he memorizes all of these works practically. And then uh, his health gets poor, so they ship him back to Italy. So when he's in Rome... Uh, the Jesuits were teaching a class of controversial theology, which uh, in those days basically means apologetics. Yep. And they had uh, they didn't make it work. They, whoever was teaching it, they just couldn't get it off the ground. So they go to St. Robert and say, oh, yeah, we know you just got back and you're supposed to rest, but here, take on this class. And so he does, and one of the things that blew everybody away is not only did he have the almost perfect knowledge of you know all of the Protestant writers and what they had taught, at least the main ones, but he also knew the fathers. And he knew the fathers so very well, almost any proposition he could array, you know, 12 Greek and Latin fathers and, and he, that he knew almost by heart. Yeah. And in those days, those were rare. Everyone would have good knowledge of St. Augustine. And beyond St. Augustine, you would have, um, so one guy might be, you'd have an expertise in origin. Another guy might have an expertise in Tertullian or Irenaeus or Ambrose. You know, and everyone would know a smattering of everyone else, but Bellarmine seemed to know them all. And that's what really blew everyone away. So he could set up a, a heading on the board, such as scripture, popes, uh, you know, yeah, sacraments, etc. And on every, every single subject or theological controversy, then he could array, this is what the Protestants teach, and now here's what scripture and the fathers teach. So then uh, his superior said, hey, we need you to put that in a book. And that became, sorry, uh, that became this. 
which is this is a 1721 copy of the controversies uh-huh. or of one of them. There's actually four of these. So, so four big folios. Four big folios, over two million words in Latin. Amazing. And so it's just an incredible amount of work that he put out. So that's uh, and that that's how this all came to be. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, this book that you've translated. Right. This comes from. I mean, this is a tiny sliver yes. out of the controversies. This is from Volume One's Book One and Two. Since the Reformation, is there any greater intellect? Mm-hmm. I mean, does anyone? I mean, Alfonso's Liguori is important, right? Very. Um, I would say, pro- I mean, everyone builds, a, the whole thing is a fabric. Bellarmine himself would never have counted any of this work for very much, because no saint does. Yes. Right? And he's one of the rare intellectuals that also wasn't just a saint, but he'd, he'd hit transforming union. I mean, he was living a deep mystical life. Mm-hmm. And you see it later in life. It's in the canonization document. Servant said that he was sent to fetch him, and he was walking in the courtyard praying the rosary, and didn't even notice him, uh, because he was so absorbed in prayer that he didn't notice, and so he decides he gets, gets up the courage to actually kind of prick him on the shoulder, and he acts like a child who's just, you know, had a little uh, needle or something that pricks him mm-hmm. out of sleep or something, yeah. and w- which is a sign of transforming union, according to all the mystical authors. Mm-hmm. And he had it again, you know, deep love for the poor. He had no attachment to any possessions, um, even things that all in and themselves are perfectly neutral, perfectly fine, but he, he went the extra mile to say, you know, no, I, I can't be stuck on these things. Like a, so there was an ancient sundial from like the 9th or 10th century in the residence he had when he was made a cardinal, which he hated being a cardinal, by the way, you know, to add that. Um, and then he said, well, it would be nice to kind of fix it up. And they told him how much it would cost. He said, oh, no, how many dinners for the poor is that going to be? You know, and he actually thought of it as robbing the poor mm-hmm. of uh, their meals. You know, he would go, go out in the street, somebody would ask him for alms, and he saw he didn't have any money. So he'd take his cardinal's ring, and he would give it to the guy and say, all right, now there's a certain pawnbroker over the Via de la you know, just go take that over to him and uh, it, he'll give you what you need. And then he'd go back later and get the ring back so he doesn't cause scandal <laughs> and uh, so many things. <laughs> or he had a silver vase given by Cardinal Aldo Brandini, who's Pope Clement VIII's nephew. And uh, his, his head of house, uh, Guidotti, he was always nervous because Bellarmine would always say, oh, I'll get that silver vase and, and uh, give it here to this poor man so he can get some money for the silver. And, and he was like, no, 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 no. And he would always go find some more money because he didn't want the Pope's nephew to see that Bellarmine had given it away and, and take offense to it, you know, yeah. <laughs> things like that. But he so loved the poor. And also when he was a bishop, same thing, emptied out basically his, his cha- anything that properly belonged to the bishop uh, in terms of his own use and, and money and whatnot. He made sure to give everything to the poor. He, he paid to bring priests in, preached to the people, and he paid them. That way they wouldn't ask for anything, because he knew the, the, the type of people that in, in uh, the Naples area where he was a bishop. And he realized, you know, they've had the vagus priest problem for so long. You know, priests, barely any training, come out, do some, the equivalent of pig Latin over some bread, and say, oh, look, I did a mass, give me some money. And so now that <clears throat> he's uh, paid the money, so the priests will come in and just preach and ask nothing of the people. Once they see that, they'll come and listen, which is exactly what happened. You know, it was an amazing thing. He's really the model of a completely selfish, sacrificial bishop until he gets yanked out of that very blessed life and back into the cardinal's life in uh, Rome under Pope Paul V. Excellent, excellent. So a saint and a scholar. 